This is Paul Schneiderman today on the 13th edition of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. Today I have a special guest, Brian Berger. Brian, hang tight. I want to give you a little introduction to the listeners, and then I will fire away with some questions. Brian Berger has worked in the sports business industry for more than two decades as a radio broadcaster and as a public relations expert. Brian at one time worked for the Portland Trailblazers. Brian launched his own sports entertainment firm, BBPR, back in 1998. Brian is the founder and CEO of the Sports PR Summit. Brian founded the company Everything is on the Record, where he works with athletes, entertainers, and executives uh, through the tough media and social landscape that exists today. Brian is also a host of Sports Business Radio. Brian has interviewed many prominent sports executives, athletes, and other figures. It's a great show. I want to recommend the listeners go to sportsbusinessradio.com. They can listen to Brian's shows and hear his fascinating guests. Sports Business Radio has rated as a top 100 podcast in the business news section of iTunes. It's also been rated as a top 50 sports business Twitter, followed by Forbes for at least three years. Today, we're going to learn more about Brian. Brian's work and his thoughts about all sorts of sports business issues. As the listeners can tell, Brian Berger is a multi-dimensional professional in the sports business. Brian, thank you for coming on Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. Thanks for having me, Paul. Absolutely, Brian. Well, Brian, I want you to first give the listeners a little bit about your background that got you into the public relations side of sports. I'm going to ask you some more questions about sports business radio later, but first tell us about what everything is on, the record is all about, a little bit about uh, your work as the CEO of the Sports PR Summit. So I'll start with everything is on the record. You know, we live in a day and age where everyone has a camera and a recording device on their phone, and many of the teams and companies that we work with want us to educate our clients on how everything is on the record. One tweet, one picture, one text, one email can instantly ruin your brand and the brands that you're tied to. So we work with a number of different organizations to uh, help them navigate the slippery slope that is social media today. And then with Sports PR Summit, I founded that in 2013. I used to go to the NBA league meetings when I worked with the Blazers, and it was great to talk to the other NBA teams, but I always thought, wouldn't it be great to talk to people from the NFL and Major League Baseball and Nike and Adidas and ESPN and Fox, and there was nothing that truly brought the sports PR world together, so we launched the event, and we have elite athletes at the event, had executives like Adam Slipper and Jerry Bettman and uh, Oliver Luck and others, Stephen Ross at the event, Isaiah Thomas, DeMarcus Ware. So it's been a great way for people to understand each other's world as far as the athletes, the media people, and the PR people who uh, sometimes are at odds with each other. Well, I can tell you're doing great work, Brian. It looks very fascinating what what you've done with the Sports PR Summit. This is Paul Schneiderman, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with Brian Berger. Brian, can you give me an example of a sports public relations problem that you've worked on? Well, so I have NDAs with a number of my clients, but I guess I'll give you one that isn't necessarily crises related, but um, it, it was interesting. I worked with a marathon a few years ago, and it was right after the Boston Marathon and the shootings at the Boston Marathon, not the shootings, but the the bombing at the Boston Marathon. And this marathon didn't really anticipate what was going to happen next. And because they were the next domestic marathon in the United States, people were honoring victims of the Boston Marathon, and there was increased media coverage of the marathon, and so we ended up working with Homeland Security and uh, local police enforcement. And sometimes people don't know what to anticipate. So because I've done a number of events, have been doing this for a long time, I always try and anticipate the unknown for our clients. Sure. And that was certainly a case where the Eugene Marathon didn't anticipate what was coming next, but we certainly planned for it after we worked for them. <laughs> 
Well, that's a really interesting example, Brian. That Boston marathon with the atrocities that occurred a couple years ago was, was something that definitely affected everybody in the sports world. Brian, um, I want to ask you a little bit about the and what's going on with enhanced technology. With enhanced technology, you know, the fan interaction is now available online, Brian. And with rising costs of tickets, are we going to see more half-empty stadiums in and arenas? Are fans basically less incentivized in part due to modern technology and ticket prices to attend sports games these days in the future? Give me your, give me your feedback on those questions, Brian. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting um you know, there's still some sports that sell out the games, but with increased ticket prices and food and beverage prices and parking and the enhancements, like you said, of watching the game on TV or on your handheld or mobile device, and if you combine that with the millennial generation, which is used to watching things on technology and they have short attention spans, it's going to be interesting in the next five to ten years. We're already seeing attendance decrease at a number of sporting events. Right. But the thing that's interesting is, you know, I don't know if you saw in Beijing this past year, they filled the Olympic venue. 108,000 people showed up to watch the championship of esports. So esports is growing, but regular sports attendance is declining a little bit. So. As this next generation comes up and their viewing habits and consuming habits are different, it's going to be something to watch for sure. Interesting dichotomy you just mentioned. Very interesting, Brian. Well, Brian, I've been a host. Now, you're my 13th show, so I'm really learning the ropes at this radio gig. You're a guy that's interviewed so many people. You've interviewed sports commissioners, executives, athletes, all sorts of interesting people. And one thing I'm learning by in this business, Brian, is that every interview, there's something new you learn from a guest in a subject matter. Uh, one example, I had former U.S. Senator Slay Gorin on a couple weeks ago, and I asked him a non-sports question about a tough Senate vote that he cast. He gave a very interesting answer, Brian. Brian, again, you've interviewed so many famous, interesting people in the sports business. Can you mention like one or two really interesting things that you learned during an interview with a guest that was sort of unexpected and really stood out as especially interesting? Well, so first of all, doing your research before an interview is so important. Obviously, you've done your research for today, but I'll give you an example. When I interviewed Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, sure. investor on Shark Tank, I did my homework, and I like to find the facts that no one else finds. A lot of the famous people, the celebrities, they get asked the same questions over and over again. So I found out when Mark Cuban attended Indiana University that he had two jobs. One was selling powdered milk door-to-door. <laughs> And two was he taught disco dancing lessons to co-eds at Indiana University. So one of my strategies in interviews is to ask those types of questions early in the interview, show the person I'm interviewing that I've done my homework, I found those little nuggets out about them, and then they relax with me, and I put them on my couch, so to speak, and they talk to me very openly the rest of the interview. So... It all comes from finding those little nuggets, finding those stories that the guest wants to share. The other piece of advice I would give you is when I first started, I would go into this interview with many of my questions, and I just worked my way through my questions, but I did do as good of a job of listening to the answers. Sure. And sometimes the answers will take you in a different direction than what you may have mapped out before you started the interview. And the best advice I can give you is go where the interview takes you. Go with the flow of the gap versus being so buried to your questions that you don't go with the flow of the guest and follow them where the conversation takes you. Paul Schneider, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Ray with Brian Berger. Well, that's a really interesting nugget you just shared about uh, Mark Cuban, Brian, a minute ago. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. He was one of my favorite interviews uh, you know, over the years, some of my favorite interviews, Mark Cuban, David Stern was my first guest back in 2004 when he was the commissioner of the NBA. Uh, I sat down with him in person for almost two hours last December uh, in New York, and that was one of my favorite interviews. Jack Nicholas was a great interview. John McEnroe, Charles Barkley, uh, 
you know, I've been very fortunate. There in Seattle, I've, I've interviewed Pete Carroll a few times and I've spent some time with him. So I'm fascinated by people. I love to find the stories that other people don't find and ask the questions that other people aren't asking, and my audience has uh, really come to appreciate that. Can tell, Brian. I've listened to a couple of your interviews; they're very interesting and informative. By the way, Brian, you mentioned David Stern. He's not that well loved in Seattle. Um, I know. I had I to mention that. that to you. You're on a Seattle David show, Brian. Lost their team. <laughs> Brian, uh, another subject that that's going on right now is the whole subject of sports gambling. The U.S. Supreme Court is going to be deciding a New Jersey challenge and a challenge that various leads have, have made to the Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act of 1992. Brian, I'm not asking you to get into the legalities of the Supreme Court case, but do you think states in general should have more latitude and concern to sports gambling? I think they should, and I think the leagues now have come around on sports gambling. They realize how much money is out there. They'd rather have it legalized and under their jurisdiction than kind of the wild left that it is right now. So... I think eventually, whether it's with this ruling or, or soon down the road, we're going to see major changes where gambling is going to become legalized and uh, it's going to be much more regulated than it is right now, and the leagues are going to profit from all the money that's out there. And there should be some interesting sports business implications with that, Brian, right? Oh, absolutely. Whether it's technology or you look at Las Vegas now, they've got... NHL, they're soon going to have the Raiders. Uh, I, I think there's going to be tons of implications from it, but I think the biggest one will be that the leagues will finally be able to capitalize on the billions of dollars that are being gambled worldwide. We'll have to see if the Supreme Court does that case, Brian. Brian, more Americans watched the Women's World Cup final in 2015 than the NBA finals of the Stanley Cup. Is this a sign that female fans are more powerful consumers? Is this a sign that soccer will get bigger in the United States? Well, soccer is a global sport. Not that the NBA isn't, but soccer really is the world sport. So, you know, it's not surprising that a huge audience would tune in to watch women's soccer. And by the way, uh, as far as American soccer goes, there's many more people that identify and can name the women's soccer players and the men's team. Right. Because of the success that they've had over the years. So I'm not surprised by that. You know, I'm in Portland, and the Portland Thorns from the NWSL play here, and they average 20,000 fans a game, which is more than many NBA teams draw, and it's actually the most heavily attended women's sports franchise in the world. So... I think women's sports is growing. I have a 13-year-old daughter. I pay attention to women's sports very closely, and you know, I think it's great that you know the WNBA is doing well, and their viewership is up, and soccer is doing well. And you know, the more these leagues thrive, the better it is for uh, young girls and women. Yeah, a little interesting fact, Brian, though, isn't it, that the Women's World Cup in 2015 had more viewers in the NBA Finals than the Stanley Cup? Now, again, I'm not surprised by it because it's a global audience. Brian, athletes are using platforms right now to take a stand on lots of social and political issues. Um, I want to get some of your thoughts, Brian, about how revenues could be affected if sports become overly political. Well, so one of the things that I do via everything is on the record is have these conversations in locker rooms with athletes about pros and cons of taking a stand on political issues. And what I basically tell the athletes is 50% of the people will applaud you and say, great for that athlete for using their platform to speak out on important global issues. And then the other half is going to say, shut up and stick to sports. I don't care what you have to say about politics. Just be quiet and play your sport. And where I come down is... I applaud the athletes who take a stand. Um, you know, Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods took criticism for many years for not taking a stand on issues right. where they could have had some major impact. And, you know, the athletes that speak out, whether I agree with them or not, I think they're brave for speaking out and for using their platforms. And I think many of the top athletes are so wealthy now with their contracts and their endorsement deals. If they lose an endorsement deal or two, 
they're not bothered by it. Whereas, you know, Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods, they were a little bit afraid of losing some of those endorsement deals. So they didn't speak out on things because they didn't want to alienate half of their audience. But I do think we've seen with the NFL that there's a lot of people who have tuned out and have said, you know, I don't support these athletes who are disrespecting the flag in their mind. I don't think it is disrespecting the flag. I think, you know, they're... they're protests are meant for things other they're not trying to disrespect the uh, armed forces or the military or the flag they're trying to take a stand on issues that are important in the world i think they could do it in a different way than kneeling during the anthem and i always tell the athletes as well put something on the bulletin board for us to achieve don't just kneel and then when someone asks what are you kneeling for you say well everyone else is killing or I'm protesting, give me concrete changes that you want made so that you can hold us accountable, and then when those changes are made, we can say, okay, you should stop protesting because we made these changes. But I don't like the athletes who just protest to follow the crowd. You can have something that you're standing for and be very clear in your interviews and your communication as to what change you're trying to affect. If you look at Anquan Bolden and you look at Malcolm Jenkins and Chris Long and, and some of these other athletes, they can tell you exactly the changes that they're trying to affect, whereas there's other athletes who, in my mind, are just following the crowd. You want follow-through, Brian, and that's what I'm hearing from, partially what I'm hearing from you. Paul Schneiderman, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with Brian Berger. Brian, I want to point something out to you. Tell me if you agree with this contradiction. It's kind of interesting. A lot of the people that are so critical of, say, Kaepernick have no problem with conservative entertainers, going back to, say, the late President Reagan. Um, you have some conservative athletes that express their political points of view, like Steve Largent, Jack Kemp, Tim Tebow. Do you see a little contradiction there? There's so much attacks on Kaepernick, but some of the same folks are so critical of Kaepernick almost forget that there's some conservative entertainers and athletes who've been activists too? Yeah, I think there, you know, there's polarizing figures, and certainly Kaepernick is a polarizing figure of this era that in the last few years. He's become kind of the, the poster child for this movement of many of today's athletes. And, you know, obviously he was honored by Sports Illustrator recently as the Muhammad Ali uh, person of the year. Saw that. But, yeah, I, I do think sports fans, a lot of them are the stick to sports crowd, right? Just play your sport. But if a political figure or an actor, you look at someone like Leonardo DiCaprio or George Clooney or some of the other activists that are out there, people don't have a problem with them, but if you're an athlete, then they have a problem. So it is a little bit of a contradiction. Yeah, I would agree with you, Brian. Brian, I want to ask about the global growth of the NBA. You know the NBA very well, Brian, and the NBA, as we know, has big TV contracts. I read the average NBA franchise, I believe, is worth well over a billion dollars. NBA revenues are real high. We keep hearing about close to half of the NBA teams, though, are, are in trouble. What are your thoughts on this dichotomy, Brian, that the league as a whole is doing well, but we always hear about all these teams losing money? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think the NBA is the best league in the United States at promoting itself globally. I've been to China, I've been to Japan, I've been to the Philippines. And you see the NBA stars on billboards in those cities. You see their names everywhere. And you don't see that with Major League Baseball or the NFL or the NHL. So the NBA has done a fantastic job. My friend David Stern, who I know isn't popular there, <laughs> really started that movement of globalizing the league. Um, you know, games are on all over the world. You can walk into a bar in the Philippines and, and watch, you know, Eric Spolster, who's got family in the Philippines and the Miami Heat and, you know, LeBron James is everywhere. And a lot of these players go over to Asia in the offseason to promote the game and their shoes and, and things of that nature. So I think the NBA has done a really good job of promoting itself globally. And I think the individual athletes promote themselves well via their shoe companies and their other business design experience in 2008 to go over to China when Kobe Bryant was there, and I followed him around for a day. I also followed Steve Nash and Yao Ming for a day, and to see how they were received by the Chinese was really amazing. And then I did go to the Philippines with Eric Spolstra, 
and I saw how he was received and how they think of NBA over there. They love they basketball the Philippines. They love it there. I've been there. Sport in the Philippines. Yeah, they love it there at the NBA. Brian, um, but, but how do you explain this dichotomy, though? The NBA doing so well at the global level, but we keep hearing about these teams losing money. Well, you know, it's still it's different than the NFL because in the NFL, the revenue sharing, you know, Green Bay can get the same revenue sharing as the New York Giants or the Los Angeles Rams. And in the NBA, you don't have that. So there's the major market deals like you've got the ESPN and the TNT money that's divided between the teams, but then each team makes its own local media deal. So, obviously, the Knicks and the Lakers are going to get far more for their media deals than the Memphis Grizzlies and the Portland Trailblazers. Sure. So, there's the have and the have not when it comes to the local market media deals, and that's why, you know, the Knicks and the Lakers are paying revenue sharing and the teams like the Grizzlies, who are taking revenue sharing, you know, don't make as much money. In, unless they go with the NFL model, where it's basically revenue share across the board, and everyone shares, you know, everything equally. I don't know how you get away from that. Obviously, you know, you can charge more for cool side seats in LA and New York than you can in Minnesota at Milwaukee. So there's always going to be kind of the have and have not in the NBA, the way the economics are set up. Really appreciate your perspective, Brian. You really broke it down and I think gave the listeners a lot of information. This is Paul Schneiderman, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with Brian Berger. Brian, uh, this is a Seattle show, so I guess we have a little bit of a Seattle-centric perspective on, on certain levels. Uh, what is your national sports business take on the likelihood of the NBA coming back to Seattle in the next few years? And what do you think of the plan the NHL accepting an application for an NHL franchise in Seattle. What, what do you see happening in the future of the NBA and the NHL in Seattle? So I think NHL will happen first. Um, it's no secret, but uh, I, I think that's going to happen fairly quickly. For the NBA, you know, I, I think it's five to ten years away. I, I'd love to see it happen earlier. There are a few franchises that could potentially move, Memphis being one of them. Um, so there's always a chance of relocation. I don't think the NBA has plans for expansion for, you know, at least five more years. But I think there's this thought in the league office that, M- that Seattle was always like the great NBA city. I think there's a regret that there's not a team in Seattle. So if an adequate facility, a modern facility that has suites and all the modern amenities is built, I would be shocked if the NBA isn't back in Seattle. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens. I think you're absolutely right. It looks like the NHL is probably going to come to Seattle first. I think that'd be. I think we could be a good NHL city. Would you agree with that? Seattle as an NHL market. Oh, I, th- I think it's definitely uh, NHL market. I think it'll help San Jose, and, and there will be a rivalry there. Uh, but I think it's an NHL market. I think it's a lot easier to get the NHL to put a team in Seattle today than it would be to get an NBA team in Seattle. Sure seems like it, Brian. Brian, I want to ask you a baseball question. I have a couple young cousins who are good baseball players, but they decided to quit baseball when they started high school. And I I seem to hear that from a lot of families. A lot of kids just don't have the baseball interest they used to have. A lot of kids find it too slow. I happen to be a big baseball fan, but does baseball, Brian, have a current and long-term marketing problem? You know, I think they need to do a better job marketing their star players, for sure. Um, you know, one of the nice things about baseball players, you can see their faces very well. I mean, unlike NFL players who wear masks, you can see the Major League Baseball players, and, and I think Major League Baseball needs to do a better job. There's amazing young players in Major League Baseball, and they're not mainstream. They don't have the same following that NBA players have, or even the elite NFL players. So... I think Major League Baseball needs to do a better job with that. I think they need to speed up the game, because you're right, games are too long. And especially as the millennials start to take over and have a shorter attention span, I don't know how much they're going to watch baseball. But I think there's definitely a future for baseball. Um, you know, it is the American pastime. I think the World Series the last two years between Cleveland and the Cubs, and this year with the Dodgers and Astros were 
two of the best World Series of the last 25 years, so that's been great on the marquee stage, and the ratings have been up. But I, I think baseball does have some work to do, for sure. Yeah, I, I actually think you're totally correct, Brian. The last couple World Series have been a lot of fun, but but your analysis is, is interesting about baseball. Brian, uh, we, we got a, a couple minutes left, not a whole lot of time, but I want to ask you about any thoughts about big money in college sports. And do you have any thoughts on how college sports could, could be reformed a little bit? Well, what's interesting, I just was in New York uh, about a month ago interviewing Mark Emmert, the president of the NCAA, for the Sports Business Radio Roadshow, which we do in front of a live audience. And, you know, we talked a lot about this. And, you know, it's interesting, the moment that you start paying players it gets interesting because, you know, would you hire 18- and 19-year-old players if it was an open market? Or would you go out and get older players who haven't quite made it to the elite level, like the NBA or the NFL? Um, it's an interesting question. I, I think there's so much money in sports now that there needs to be a better way to compensate the players, whether it's paying them, whether it's giving them, you know, more benefits for education, uh, whether it's giving them more food, better housing. Like, there's got to be a way to compensate the athletes for the millions and millions of dollars that they're generating for the schools. And, you know, Mark Emmert has made some rules to get better and to use some common sense, but these rules were written years and years ago when there wasn't the money that's in amateur athletics now. So I think it needs to be looked at with today's lens, but the problem is the NCAA has 1,100 schools that are members and trying to get the presidents of these schools and the athletic directors to agree to anything is not easy. Brian, we're winding down. It's just been wonderful to have you on Sports and Stuff, and I hope to have you back one day, Brian. Thanks for coming on our show. Thank you very much for having me. You take care.